Coming up on Tech Thing, the latest Razer gaming laptop, ASIC 10, is a Kickstarter fail, a better calendar app for families, and boy, do we have fun at Maker Faire. All coming up on Tech Thing. And a big thank you to our patrons, Derek, David, Bill, and Christopher. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing possible at patreon.com slash tech thing. And don't forget, $10 and up patrons, you gotta hang out with Shannon and I tonight. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we have something useful in every single show. Oh my goodness. What? Yeah, Kickstarter. <laughs> we had a big conversation, you, mm -hmm. me, y'all, yep. uh, about Kickstarter. I'm going to call it officially speculation, gambling. Episode 149 back in November. Oh. Uh, episode 152. Um, we had a long... A couple weeks for later, right? This is episode 152. Uh, viewer Craig sent us a great set of guidelines on how not to lose your money on Kickstarter. Kind of, he's kickstarted a lot of projects, possibly yeah. even more than Tom Merritt. I remember that discussion. Yeah, Craig. Oh my uh, what did he say? He had like a 75% success rate or so. Mm -hmm. Not bad. My success rate just took a dip this week. Um, no. This week being Maker Fair, I really like how Craig put his approach. Um, he basically said, I do it to support creators not to get stuff. If I want to shop, I use Amazon, which is a really healthy way to look at that, which I bring up because remember the ASIC 10 headphone project we were talking about in November that was so many years late? Yeah, it shuttered this weekend. As in, oh, thanks for no. the money, no headphones for you, which sucks. You know, but I had had a demo and I had heard them and I wanted to buy in. And his dad used to say, you buy the ticket and you takes the ride, son. Oh, man. Or as a buddy of mine says, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, it's like gambling. But sometimes you get presents. That's so disappointing. So I should say I've had a lot of success on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Um, but this is definitely going to make me a touch more leery. Yeah, don't blame you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's very, very rare that I back something on Kickstarter myself. I'm, I'm more of like an Etsy creator vibe type mm -hmm. person, but when I do back something on Kickstarter, so far I've had a 100% response rate. Right. So, so far everything's been good, but I'm just waiting for that moment that I back something and it fails. Like currently I have two things backed and that's it. And both of those are supposed to be shipping this summer, so we'll see. I'll know the day that happens because you'll be throwing potted plants around the office. <laughs> Well, I wasted $35 on what? They're both video games, or no, they're board games. So hopefully they come out, but I won't be out that many funds right. if they don't. For the most part, and it's funny, we're going to be talking about a, about a successful Kickstarter project I saw at Maker Fair. Yay! Just remember, it's not a guarantee. That's true. But you know what is a guarantee? New laptops for new 2018. Laptops. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, uh, Razer Blade, they've been coming out with new, or, or, well, I should say Razer has been coming out with new Razer Blades every single year uh, for the past several years. And I currently have the 2017 model, which is the one that you can see on the desk right here. But this year they just announced. Sorry, I'm looking for it on the monitor over there. I'm like, oh yeah, you can see it. Oh well, yeah, right here. <laughs> it's under yeah, the stickers. Yeah, it's a little covered with stickers, but that's because I don't like the Razer mm -hmm. logo on the back of it it's so bright and green so you shot a thing down at nvidia studios yeah. where you kind of did you do an unboxing or a review it, it was basically a first look so okay. i got to play with it for just a couple of days not long enough to get like super in with the testing but i understand the specs and i'm able to tell what the differences are between the old model and the mm -hmm. new one so the key differences in the new model are the sleeker look the super thin bezel and the upgraded specs the size and the weight are comparable to the older model but since they gave it this nice edge to edge display you're your screen is larger without impacting the overall size of nice. the laptop. Yeah, it's super, super nice. Uh, the specs include an upgraded 144 hertz display at 1080p. The one I have currently is 60p. They also have a 1060 or 1070 GPU and an 8th gen Intel Core i7 CPU. The RAM in the new model is 16 gigs, but you can upgrade it up to 32 gigs, which is super nice. So 1060, 1070 you're optional. Yep. They're only selling Core i7 models? Core i7 models. Wow. Wow. Boom! Right out of the gate. Yeah, cool. pretty nice there. And they also have storage options. They start at 256, but you can increase it up to 2 terabytes. So plenty of options there. All it takes is money. Yeah, <laughs> all it takes is money. That's true. But hey, if you wanted to save a few hundred bucks, you could get the 256 model and just upgrade it to 2 terabytes because you can just unscrew the back and it's very easy to unscrew. Your current Razer is the single loudest laptop I have ever heard. Yep. Is the new design less loud? So 
Yes, it is okay. less loud, which is really nice. Uh, they, it is not super hot either, and it is less loud. I think it's because they did change up the cooling technology inside with a new vapor chamber and heat exchanges on two of the sides, which disperse a lot of that heat. Although I will say that my cat, she kind of still likes to sit on the keyboard. Because so. it's warm. Because it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> I did have one problem with the keyboard, speaking of which, uh, in that the arrow keys were moved. So the current model has the arrow keys below shift, while the new model has the arrow keys positioned next to shift, and FN, the little FN mm -hmm. key, has been moved to the corner. And I have photos to give you a comparison of that. I kept on hitting arrow when I meant to hit shift, and I won't lie, that was a little bit annoying to me. Uh, also, if you recall, I had replaced my 2016 razor blade because the left click stopped working, and they have now upgraded to a single glass trackpad with no separate click buttons, which is probably a good thing, and integrated <laughs> clicks inside of that glass uh, trackpad. So. I will say it is a lot nicer to use and it feels a lot sleeker. I feel based on the experiences of you and others mm -hmm. that razors, keyboards, and mice have been more reliable than their laptops. Yes, okay. I would say that as well. <laughs> Hopefully the new generation of laptops I think so. It seems like they've been listening to a lot of the complaints in that, like, you know, they increased the screen size without increasing the size mm -hmm. of the laptop. And they, they changed around the trackpad, which was my issue in right. the first place. So there are those things, although I do have a concern about that keyboard and the movement of the arrow keys. But I mean, that's also, I mean, having, <laughs> having been dealing with keyboard laptop yeah. changes. I mean, every time they move something, the first three weeks is like a living hell. Yes, it is. Like, it's they so did, true. Well, they did like, one I'm where sure they. I'm sure I would get used to it over time. Yeah. I definitely would, and I only had a couple of days with it. Uh, but I should also mention too: there's the battery, and since it has that you know larger <laughs> Good to screen, have a battery in a you laptop. would <laughs> you would think like maybe the battery dies faster. Uh, for my testing, it did last all day while I was gaming, and I did some video nice. editing on it as well. So I expect with further testing, it would last as long as my current model, or possibly even longer. I am going to try and get a review in it, unit in and give you a much deeper look at the new model soon. So let me know what you would mm -hmm. like me to focus on because I would love to check it out further. You can either tweet me, I'm at snubs, or ask at techthing.com for email. We love the ultra-wide curved monitors around here and the idea of a gaming-friendly ultra-wide curved monitor that doesn't look like it was ripped off an alien spaceship <laughs> is tempting. Not that there's anything wrong with alien spaceship design, it's are you, just... Are you talking crap on my Alienware ultra-wide monitor? Amongst other monitor designs. <laughs> but Well, yeah, I mean, great monitor, but there's like this giant <laughs> triangular stand of doom. It's true. I know, but it's so cool though. So when BenQ released uh, an upgrade, so they had an ultra-wide gaming monitor, it was not so highly reviewed. Uh, then they came up with the 3440 by 1440 EX3051R. Mm. The R is a big deal. Uh, with It's basically a vertical alignment panel. Think uh, IPS but with faster refresh rates and better color than TN. I was Trey curious. Now they're not actually pushing it too hard as a gaming monitor, but we're talking about basically a panel with a 100 hertz refresh rate and free sync built in. Esports champions might not be down with the four millisecond per pixel refresh rate, but frankly, they're not looking to me for recommendations on monitors. They're rocking old school TN panels with meh colors because they don't care. They want the speed because they have unbelievable reflexes that I ain't got. <laughs> gaming on a monitor with an 1800R curve is sweet. I like the gaming on the super tight monitors. It kind of wraps around you a bit. That is a much tighter curve than the 3800R uh, on the Dell 34. 15W, that's my primary production monitor. That number, 1800 or 3800, that's millimeters. It's the radius of the curvature. So an 1800R monitor is like the edge of a 3.6 meter circle, mm. much more noticeable than the, th like, well, 3.8 times two and then yeah. go like this. Yeah. Uh, th that's on my regular Dell. My regular Dell is super flat. Um, in testing, like other super kind of tight radius monitors, yeah. um, the, the straight lines on the monitor, like the tops of windows, they annoy me because they look curved yeah. <laughs> until a few days in when my brain kind of adapts to it and I stop noticing. So this is probably not the monitor for a serious graphics maven. I would stick to something uh, like my ultra sharp or regular flat monitor because if you're looking at lines and right. design, you yeah. don't want to compensate for something that nobody else is going to be using when they view it. Gaming though, the uh, EX3501R has a much higher refresh rate than that Dell. And if you've got a compatible AMD car, you can run free sync and minimize, if not eliminate, tears and choppiness. Now, GPU prices way down, almost an MSRP. 
uh, the AMD cards are still not cheap enough for me to buy one for testing. <laughs> to be honest with you, I was happy enough gaming at higher refresh rates than on my regular monitor. And I love that it's height adjustable. Oh, yes. Well, we've seen so many monitors lately where it's like, you get one height, yep. so raise or lower your desk. I, I absolutely love having yep. the height being able to be adjustable. I don't think tilt is an optimal no. ergonometric adjustment for a monitor. It doesn't take the place of height adjustment. No, it just makes you stare down. <laughs> While the EX3501R has HDR support, it's we're talking about a peak brightness like 300 nits. Um, think of it as very mild HDR support. Um, VESA doesn't actually certify anything this um, dim. Not that 300 <laughs> nits isn't bright enough for non-HDR use. And you will see in some cases a noticeable difference between HDR and non-HDR content. Um, but this is not a full HDR monitor. It's not VESA certified either. And speaking of VESA, I wish it had a VESA mount on the back mm. because if you break the monitor or you want to use it with sort of a super gaming rig, yeah. uh, you're not going to be able to do that unless you like using epoxy. Good to know. There are two HDMI 2.0 ports, a display port, a headphone jack, a USB 3.0 up, two USB 3.0 down, uh, and there is a USB-C video jack on the monitor, but it would not power my Dell XPS 13, which is not a particularly big surprise. Mm, okay. So, $850. This is not cheap, and it's also not FreeSync 2. Not that there's much of that out there, because FreeSync 2 was basically announced at CES. FreeSync 2 and the next generation G-Sync are mostly about bringing serious HDR support to Windows. And especially in the case of FreeSync, it's more of a parallel. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's going to be like FreeSync's going to keep going, FreeSync 2 is going to keep going. They'll, yeah. they'll keep motoring along. Um, but all of that, including the next generation of G-Sync, are about bringing serious HDR support to Windows. Feel free not to hold your breath because this is going to take a while to roll out. Because first there has to be hardware in terms of yep. GPUs and monitors and then games. And then, you know, by the time you're <laughs> ready for your next monitor, Think about the next generation, uh, FreeSync and G-Sync. So, for general use with a heavy side of games, if you have an AMD GPU, put this one on your short list. If you yeah. are a productivity kind of Photoshop person, probably not my first choice. I'm not so much on the Photoshop, I'm a video person, so I love video editing on a nice big curved screen because it gives me so much room for my timeline. It's amazing. Does Premiere in a highly curved or a, a tight radius monitor, does that drive you a little nuts? Or nope, is it not at all. I, I use it every single day and I have no issues but with that doesn't, it. But that doesn't I'm not have editing a... graphics. Okay. Yeah, if I was editing graphics and I needed to pay yeah. very good attention to those dimensions and things like that, it would bother me. You've got the same Dell as I do, though. It's a very yeah. shallow curve. Although I have a different one at home. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Does it have a deeper curve? Yeah, it's deeper. Okay. And so does Keith, and he games a lot on it, and he has had no issues, and he's one of the best players with PUBG. He's won many times. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Gaming on a tight radius? <laughs> It's, it's exactly really cool. what it's for. It's Look, really cool. <laughs> I threw the horns. <laughs> <laughs> what are you looking for in your next monitor? We want to know. Email ask at techthing.com or you can tweet at techthing. We love your questions, your tips, and your suggestions of products and ideas to check out. You can tweet at techthing, at snubs, at Patrick Norton, or just email ask at techthing.com. And a big shout out to our patrons at patreon.com slash techthing. You pay the bills, you make the show possible, and frankly, you keep my family fed. Thank you, patrons. Join the crew that makes Tech Thing happen at patreon.com slash tech thing. And remember, we got Patreon-only goodies up there. We did a Patreon-only podcast. We got a build video coming. We got a hangout for the $10 and up crew. Go to patreon.com slash tech thing. And seriously, thank you all so much for supporting the show. We got an email from Harrison who writes, my family has been looking at different calendar apps to try to sync up our busy schedules for the summer ahead. I was curious if you have any recommendations on which apps work best for Android with the occasional sharing to Apple. Appreciate your suggestions. Fan of the show from Harrison. Thank you, Harrison. So Harrison says that Google Calendar can work, but he was curious what we used and if there was an alternative out there. I'll be honest, I just use Google Calendar because I'm lazy and I've never looked for a calendar app, but Patrick has. Well, this actually, I was inspired. Uh, and I'm it inspired also, now. Well, it's also, so I've actually also recently run into a lot of folks that are crowing about how much they like the current iteration of Microsoft Outlook and the whole idea of one place to have their email and their contacts and their really? calendar. Yeah, actually, wow. I mean, and also, you know, if you haven't used Outlook in five or eight or 10 years, Me. it's worth taking a look. <laughs> Cloud Cal is amazing, but it's Android only. Fantastical 2 is beloved, but Mac only. And I gotta say, Cloud Cal 
is gorgeous. Yeah. I just want to go back to the cloud cow picture one more time because it's just that pretty. It looks really nice. One you might want to check out because I had never heard of it until I started digging into this is Time Tree. And they are Mac, or I should say they are iOS and Android. And they seem to be actually interested in dealing with sort of family schedule mayhem oh. and combining like, I like the idea that you could start turning sort of a grocery list into a date or yeah. a to-do. It's an interesting concept. It takes a little shifting of your skull, or at least for me, uh, to think about a calendar in different ways. But this also happens with every single application like this or, yeah. or, or uh, project management app. Because mm -hmm. every project management app always seems to have like a different like twist. Mm -hmm. And I've discovered I hate trying to use project management apps for anything other than managing projects. And most of them aren't very good at managing projects. Not that I'm bitter. But I've I've experienced the same issues. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> project management sticks to the project management applications and scheduling sticks with the calendar. Yeah. Definitely check out Time Tree. Um, he's gonna report back to us on how it works for him. I'm actually cool. setting it up with my family, so we will let you know. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that because I'm always looking for ways to prioritize my time. I feel like us as peoples in the world just do not have enough time in this day and age. <laughs> it's true. I know. Ask at techthing.com. Let us know what you think and if you have any recommendations for us as far as uh, dealing with all the crazy time management and sharing those schedules with families. The 13th Annual Maker Fair Bay Area took place in San Mateo, California this Yay! weekend. And we think of it as kind of the ultimate do something analog. Yeah. Seriously. Seriously. Uh, all the things are being made as usual from uh, lace. I was watching people make lace. It was glorious. That's really cool. <laughs> to homemade tanks, which my son accidentally drove forward because the keys were left in it. And uh, <laughs> bees to the latest in 3D printing. Maker Faire is awesome. Yes. So we both went down. Mm -hmm. I am obsessed with a $500 uh, CNC router. Whoa. We'll talk about that in a second. But first, let us look at the mech that scared the bejesus out of Shannon. Oh my goodness, yeah. Can we just talk about that for a second? So we have seen Furion's mech. It's uh, this crazy, crazy, huge, gigantic thing. It's a 14 foot high dead spider. We saw it at CES, but it wasn't moving. So finally, at Maker Faire this year, it actually moved, and this is the first time they've taken the prosthesis in front of a live audience and on pavement, which was very scary. They have done a lot of testing in the desert. In real life, I felt like it was very, very scary to watch for a few reasons. So first off, it made the ground shake <laughs> as it moved across. And there were several times where it just was not very graceful and it would fall back or forth, luckily catching itself on these bumper tusks that were on both sides of it to keep it from rolling into the audience. <laughs> yeah, it was a little scary. So imagine this thing at 30 kilometers, which potentially it could do in the future. So it's kind of like a multi-legged bulldozer with no yeah. blade and limited stability. Yeah, and you got the driver inside and the driver is controlling it with his limbs. So every time his he walks, mm -hmm. one of the limbs moves. It is the craziest thing. So in Aliens, when you watch, or Alien or Alien 3 or whichever one it was, you know, when you watch the fight with the loading bots, it's very yeah. graceful and elegant. It's not so graceful. <laughs> not yet, at least. So they are hoping that this will be the start of a whole new type of sport, mech racing. But the cost ranges around half a million dollars. So I feel like it's going to be a little bit of a ways off. For now, though, I got to say, wow, the future is real. It's basically a real life anime. Mm -hmm. It's like Gundams, except in this case, Gundams are really spiders. Giant spiders. Very, very freaky. And then I spoke with someone who had a much cuter robot to share off. It was Sai over at the Star Wars Builder Club hangout. So she directed me to bb8builders.club because I was like, how could I build one of these to have everything that you need to know to build your own life-size BB-8? And Sai is currently building hers. So she showed me the internals. She explained how it runs off Arduinos and servos, and it wirelessly links to an Xbox controller, which nice. is so cool. So she was just sitting there with an Xbox One controller, just controlling the insides of this BB-8. The movements are super, super accurate, and there is also a soundboard that's built in with a speaker to give it life. And the batteries can last several hours on one charge, and the top has strong magnets that can twist and turn, which enable the head to move around like on the BB-8. And I was so curious about how that works, since the BB-8 is basically a giant sphere, and the head just goes all over the place. Mm -hmm. It's magnets. It's magnets. It's amazing. So the bottom is filled with very heavy metal pellets to give it that kind of balanced rocking motion that BB-8 does throughout the show. I feel like that's going to be an animated joke now. 
<laughs> and the head has, it also has magnets on it to match up with the magnets inside the body. Mm -hmm. It has LEDs and a receiver to interact with the components inside the body. So whenever the body makes the sounds, the LEDs on the top will also receive that data and it will mm -hmm. light up depending on what the sounds are that the BB-8 is making. They're pretty crazy. Even, even the little tiny models are pretty insane Amazing. to look at because it's an RC car inside of a spear with a magnet attached to a thing on the yeah, inside. It is. It was so cool. And I just love how there's so many components going into this. And she told me that when it started moving, it felt like her baby came to life. And <laughs> I, I totally understood where she was coming it from. Lives. It lives. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. So I'm hoping that sometime in the future, she's local, mm -hmm. and once she's finished with her BB-8, I'm going to ask her to bring it here and show it off to us. I'm so stoked about that. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah. The one downside of going to Maker Faire on Friday is there, there are only a half dozen oh. R2 units there or, oh, yeah. or Astromex there. Because a lot of times you'll walk in on Saturday or Sunday, it'll be like 25 R2s. Yeah. And you've never seen a six-year-old freak out like a six-year-old that suddenly sees like 22 <laughs> R2-D2s. Oh my goodness. So Maker Faire, like I love the mechs and I love the giant tents full of people learning how to solder. But Maker Faire has so much more. The Beekeepers Guild of San Mateo County was dispensing advice yeah. and they had bees behind glass, which I could watch for hours. I'm glad they were behind glass. Oh my goodness, the UC Master Gardener program had a booth on site with some amazing folks giving advice on how to get pests out of your garden and actually how to optimize your garden for the best produce results. Far West Mushrooms was back. They had mushroom jerky, which actually tastes better than it sounds, and a lot of gorgeous shrooms on display. Seed stoves, that round one, is made with an Ikea strainer. Moto Home, quotes architecture on two wheels, AKA a camper on a motorcycle. <laughs> I fear the crosswind. I love this sign. Do not climb free finger remover. You gotta <laughs> love the clock ship Terra and its giant 10 foot hubless wheel, even when the fire sails aren't deployed. The boys were all over this and the volunteers on the clock ship were so kind. Mm -hmm. Right next to the clock ship, I love what Flat Rat Studios did with Dupe, their gorgeous bicycle powered dog sled. Uh, and especially that they listed all the skills that it took to make dog out of this. Welding. Leather work, brah, it's just this incredible wow. list of skills that I cannot, it's just, people are like, why do people do this? Well, yeah. sometimes they do it because you learn a lot of things along the way, which is really amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Cohesion's 3D mini controllers, I'm gonna to talk to them about replacing the controller and the laser etcher I'm rebuilding. And possibly my biggest I want from Maker Faire 2018, Maslow CNC's $500 CNC router, which was a successful Kickstarter from 2016 and takes almost all of the expense out of having a CNC router. Uh, it just doesn't have a giant table and yeah. lots of servos. You just kind of watch it hang that's and do cool. its things. Um, the shiny red button that my son's pressing here, that's Ace Monster Toys booth. Um, it makes a pix every time you slam the button. Turns out they now have a 24 hour maker space in Oakland that is oh, fully cool. equipped and very reasonably priced. Tapagomi is proof that you can create with anything. Look at all of this. This is all masking tape. What? It is amazing. That's so amazing. And just as I was leaving, I saw a cargo bot zooming around, which had my wife uh, falling on the ground laughing because there's basically a wall of my garage covered with those black and yellow bins. <laughs> and she was like, you want that, don't you? And I was like, the bins are running away from me. <laughs> it was fun. Maker Faire is a fine place to find something analog to do. And Absolutely. it is a Amazing. And a big thanks to Ed and Glitch for also hanging out with me at Maker Fair. Y'all totally made the day and thank you so much for the help with my camera so I could yeah. get interviews for Hack 5. Oh my goodness. If y'all have any analog pics you want to share with us, definitely send them over to ask at techthing.com and add analog into the uh, subject header so that we can see it. I had no idea they did, uh, they taught people how to make telescopes up at Chabot. What? Yeah. <gasps> and if you've never been, uh, have you ever been to I've the telescope? Scopes on Friday night? Never been. Oh my goodness. I want to go so bad. I'm Patty Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. They open up the big telescopes in the back that Friday. Yeah, yeah, like Friday nights for free. Oh my goodness. So you can go up, including like the the hundred year old telescope and a couple of more like higher power and there's always a couple of enthusiasts out there displaying what they're doing. So Chabot what, what is have amazing. You seen through the telescopes up there? Uh, several galaxies, um, Saturn. Uh, one guy was out there doing this incredible um, 
Basically, he had a digital camera adapter on this massive uh, Dobson uh, telescope. Wow. And it was processing in real time, so he was doing this super detailed image and you were kind of watching it slowly add additional image uh, information and like you know we went and then we came back like 30 minutes later and there was this crazy uh, image oh, that we could capture wow. um, and but i didn't realize they basically had um telescope making like a club uh and i apologize i'll put the exact name and the information in the show notes um on and off since I want to say 1920 and continuously since 1950. Wow. So they were at Maker Fair, you know, grinding lenses, which I always stop and look at because That's it's awesome. like, you know, it's, it's a direct line between you and like Galileo. That's fast. <laughs> Although it does make that noise. <laughs> I would hope not. <laughs> well, it kind of makes that noise. It's just very subtle. Oh my goodness.